Good morning. My name is Maggie Hartley, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Engagement here at the National World War II Museum. Thank you for joining us today for our Lunchbox Lecture, which is sponsored by AARP Louisiana. Today's lecture is entitled Creating and Coping, POW Life and Craftsmanship with Kim Guise, the Museum's Assistant Director of Curatorial Services. This lecture is also a part of programming for the newest special exhibit at the National World War II Museum, which explores the military pastime known as trench art, the creation of art, souvenirs, and tools out of discarded materials and waste of war. So without further ado, I will now turn this program over to Kim to share more about the experience of American POWs passing time in World War II by making trench art. Thank you, Maggie. I'm Kim Geis. As Assistant Director for Curatorial Services here at the National World War II Museum, it's been my honor to be able to work with and grow the museum's collection of POW material. And it's my pleasure to be able to showcase some of this amazing material for you today, specifically items made by and used by American POWs. The museum has been collecting material from American POWs since our institution's beginning. And I featured some of these items in a past special exhibit, Guest of the Third Reich, American POWs in Europe, and that was in 2012. Some POW items are also featured in the Road to Tokyo exhibit, and others still will be featured in the upcoming Liberation Pavilion, the museum's capstone experience. One gallery in particular, The Cost of Victory, will tell of the hardships and the losses endured by many, POWs included, and also the steep price paid in winning the war. I also utilized much of the museum's POW collection in our currently ongoing continuing education course through Arizona State University, Captured American POWs in World War II. So hello to any students who might be watching today. A small group of this POW material is also currently featured in the special exhibit, Soldier Artist, Trench Art in World War II. This exhibit, curated by my colleague Tom Chikansky, is on display in the Senator John Alario Jr. Special Exhibition Hall through January 15, 2022. The exhibit takes a look at the age-old practice of trench art, the creation of art, souvenirs, and tools out of discarded materials and the waste of war. These pieces speak to the skills of their makers and the material available to them. In the case of the items made in captivity, they also tell of a desire to stay alive by being creative, to stay connected to one's family, to one's unit, and to the world while a prisoner of the enemy. In this talk, I'll take you through some of the circumstances of the POW experience in World War II the motivations POWs had in making trench art, the kinds of materials that they used, and how they acquired these source materials. And then we'll dive into some of the specific collection items and their stories. I talk about creating and coping because no matter what function these handmade items served, they also served an additional purpose, and that's to help the maker cope with captivity. The American POW experience differed widely depending on a lot of factors, but it was never pleasant. So who are these POW artisans? Who were they? And you see two here. Sergeant Frank Carrillo, who was shot down and held in Europe, and Marine Corps PFC Lionel Berto on the right. He was in the Pacific. And they were just two of the more than 120,000 individuals who spent time as prisoners of war out of the total number of Americans who served, 16.5 million. There were nearly 94,000 POWs in Europe and the Mediterranean and 27,500 in the Pacific Theater. In Europe, most early American POWs were airmen shot out of the sky, like Sergeant Carrillo, forced to bail out of their aircraft. 
But the largest numbers of troops were captured later in the war, with 23,554 Americans captured during the Battle of the Bulge alone from mid-December through late January 1945. In Europe, the average length of captivity was one year because of those large numbers captured towards the end of the war. The average age at capture was 25 and at release 26. The overall mortality rate in the European theater was approximately 1%. And the Germans built around 100 prisoner of war camps, mainly throughout Germany and Poland. And you see some of them here um, labeled on this map. And that, this was produced and distributed through the Red Cross. The POWs in Europe typically, um, on the whole, received far better treatment in the hands of their captors than those in the Pacific. Germany had signed and ratified the Geneva Convention, and although it was not always strictly adhered to, additional measures to maintain living prisoners were indeed taken. In the Pacific, and again, this is a, a map from the American Red Cross. In the Pacific, the average length of time spent as a POW was over three years, with the majority captured in the beginning of the war with the fall of the Philippines in April 1942. And in just a few days, we are coming up on the 79th anniversary of the Bataan Death March, in which tens of thousands of Americans and Filipino soldiers were forced some 60 miles into captivity. The average age at capture was 26, so a slightly higher um, average age, and at release, 29. American POWs in the Pacific were held in nearly 800 camps across the Pacific with 185 of them in Japan alone, and the rest scattered throughout Asia. So on this map, you see just a small selection of some of those camps. The camps were far smaller. Um, POWs in the Pacific endured dismal conditions and often brutal treatment and were forced to labor long hours with very little nourishment. Little to no Red Cross aid was provided, was allowed in, and although Japan indicated that it would follow the Geneva Convention, they most certainly did not. So due to these varying circumstances and to the geography, the material available to men in the Pacific and men in Europe was radically different. The museum's collection contains far more examples of items made in the European theater, as you could expect. But we do also have quite a few pieces from the Pacific and many stories of their makers and how they survived captivity. Overall, these items, POW trench art, can be divided into a few different categories. And I think of these as such. Items made for the purposes of recreation, items connected to one's identity or commemoration of the experience, and then items made to use utility. So recreational pieces were more than simple ways to pass the time. They were a way to maintain one's sanity, passing the hours, days, and weeks not knowing when one would be freed was for many maddening. Some suffered for what was termed barbed wire fever, psychosis brought on by the constraints of captivity. There were stories of men counting the barbs on the barbed wire, racing mice or frogs in the Pacific, or herding imaginary sheep in order to keep their minds active. Having something to do, having an occupation, was tremendously important in the well-being of American POWs. Making things was one way to keep busy and stay active. American officers held in the German POW camp system were not required to work under the Geneva Convention. So although not subject to rig rigorous labor, they were fighting the hourglass. And that's one illustration that you see here in the slide on the left. You can see the American POW on, in the barbed wire leaning up against the hourglass. Most of the material we have from the European theater POWs falls in line with this, 
as well. So most of the handmade items, the crafts, are from officers who typically had more time to create this kind of material. But recreational pieces include games like chess and checkers. Sometimes men played these on the backs of blankets or jackets on which they had painted a checkerboard. Um, hand cut, they also include hand cut and hand drawn playing cards and also musical instruments. So we'll look at some of that material in a bit. Here again, you see the long hours. This is from a POW journal um, from Newton Cole, who was in OFLOG 64, and he illustrates his day. So the long hours of the day. On the bottom, you can see a, a checkerboard and some playing cards. So some of these um, POW diaries can be seen online in the website for Guest of the Third Ray. One large category of items made by POWs were items made for practical purposes, for use, made with some daily problem in mind. One didn't go into captivity with all of the tools they needed to survive. Sometimes you were captured, you went into captivity with absolutely nothing. If you were blown out of an airplane or, you know, you may have had absolutely nothing on you. So everything you needed to survive had to be given to you, gathered or scrounged or made. And often this had to do with the number one concern of POWs worldwide, and that was food. Um, where would your next morsel come from and how would you prepare it, serve it, and save it? In Soldier Artists, we feature several pieces related to dining and food preparation um, other useful items, in addition to those related to food, other useful items that, you know, helped to make life a little bit easier included things like hand-sewn bags or satchels. In this photograph, you see a handmade sled and also, you know, likely handmade bags in, in this photo. And that was on the march from Stalag Luf 3 to Mosberg, the forced march. But other items include, you know, improvised knives, tools that men use to make trench art, or work gear like gloves or caps, very useful, purposeful pieces. Another category of POW trench art relates loosely to ideas of identity. The POW experience is an isolating one that left many feeling completely disconnected from their entire cause. If your identity is tied to your mission as a soldier, marine, or airman, once removed from your unit, from your commanders, from your command structure, the mission and your identity may become more difficult to hold onto. Some items were made to express pride in one's country, one's unit, and one's self. These are often pieces that relate to one's service branch, like insignia, um, badges, medals, or national symbols like flags, like the Stars and Stripes, the American flag. And this, this you can see, this is um, the Omori camp in the Pacific at upon liberation. And you see several handmade flags in that photograph. So this also encompasses this kind of identity, the idea about pieces related to identity also encompasses carvings of aircraft and the vehicle that delivered many to their captivity. Aircraft, insignia, medals, flags were all also commonly illustrated items. So we have numerous illustrations of these kinds of things in um, many of the journals that we have in the collection. Uh, I've excluded these from the talk mainly, although you'll see some in the slide, but you know, I've, I've talked on this before, and there are art, numerous articles on our website that you can refer to if you want to learn more about those POW diaries. They're fantastic sources of, um, of information about POW life and beautifully illustrated. So we're very blessed to have a lot of those in the collection um, to refer to. And here's a good example from one of those diaries again. 
Um, in Europe, the material used to craft these items could be shipped by your family at home. So you could receive some parcels from your family. Or it was often received, supplied by the Red Cross or the YMCA. And these sources weren't available to men in the Pacific, where many POWs had no communication with their family and little, if any, aid from the protect protecting power, the Red Cross. In both theaters, though, material was scrounged, salvaged, and traded. Trade of all types prospered in the camps in the Pacific and Europe. POWs traded with their guards and with locals if they had the opportunity to interact with or see them. The most valuable commodities were food and cigarettes. So you see food and cigarettes in this illustration um, from the Red Cross parcel number 10. So those were the most valuable that, that would earn you the most in terms of barter and trade. If one had American food or cigarettes acquired through the Red Cross or from home, um, these could be used to bribe guards or trade with them. And you could actually, one's family could actually write cigarette companies and request that cigarettes be sent to their loved one in the camp, and that was fairly common. So this is a theme of nearly every POW film, you know, trading with the guards and, and that kind of system. And it, it actually is a, tr is a true theme. It happened a lot. Um, a pricing system was even established in some of the, the larger camps, and this was referred to as foodaco or food account. You know, so it was an, an actual um, economic system that was established right within the camps. Several POWs remarked on how not smoking actually saved their lives because they were able to trade that valuable commodity to receive things that they actually, that they needed, um, that they wanted. So here you see another um, sample, some scans from a journal that included some cigarette papers and um, so I assume the tobacco had been, the tobacco was emptied out from these cigarettes and used, and that's just flattened um, cigarette paper pasted into this journal. But again, cigarettes were the most valuable commodity. We also see things like handmade IOUs, and this is a really precious piece here. It is a hand-drawn check. Um, so it's an IOU that was made out um, to a fellow POW by Colonel Charles Frank. He was an army veterinarian who was held in the Philippines and Japan and Korea. And Frank wrote out this $200 check to a British POW. And you can see through from all of the stamps here on the check that it was paid, it was actually paid out by his bank. It was honored by his bank. First National Bank of Mountjoy, Pennsylvania, in December 1945. So these IOUs were, you know, in, were used for things that you wanted to purchase, but you had no, um, no money or, you know, nothing to trade at the time. So people actually did use this kind of system to be paid out after um, liberation. One of the most prevalent sources of POW-made items, and you see this in soldier artist, um, is cans. Tin cans acquired from food rations supplied by the Red Cross. And that box is actually in the museum's collection. It's interesting that, you know, we have several cardboard boxes. You don't think of a box as being an artifact necessarily, but this one certainly is. The Red Cross was responsible for food, clothing, additional food, clothing, medicine, and mail of prisoners of war. And during World War II, the American Red Cross delivered more than 27 million parcels of food to the International Red Cross to be distributed to American POWs. A main stockpile and distribution point was in Geneva, Switzerland, and here you can see the enormous um, stockpile of this material. 
Parcels could be received every two weeks. So they were intended to be delivered to POWs on a regular basis, and they were packed for that purpose. So that was the ideal situation. But the uh, obverse, which happened a lot, especially in the Pacific, was that prisoners would receive perhaps one package a year on Christmas. So, you know, it really varied depending on where you were, um, what kind of additional support you received from the Red Cross. But when you did, every single part of that parcel was used. Here you see again from a journal some illustrations of what was in some of these packages, mainly food, um, but, you know, coffee, soap, cigarettes. Um, and then in the Christmas package, you see things like pipe tobacco, gum, a game, cards, a washcloth, so additional, additional material. So every part of this parcel was used. The food, of course, was consumed. The cans were flattened or otherwise prepared for use. The outer wooden crate was used. The cardboard packaging was used. That's another reason that box is so rare, you know. The cardboard packaging was used. The string used to hold the packages together was used, and so on. Every bit of what you had was used. There was no excess. Not a single bit was wasted. So in Europe, wood actually in Europe and the Pacific. So the, the image on the, on the left is um, in Europe, that's Stalaglyft One. The image on the right is a camp in the Pacific. And so wood was another commonly used source for POW handicrafts. In Europe, it was gathered from across the German camps. Barracks and bunks were often made of wood and the components could be carefully removed. The film The Great Escape shows how bed slats were removed from bunks to shore up the escape tunnels dug in Stalaglyph 3 to prevent them from collapsing. But if you remove too many slats from your bed, from your bunks, they also collapse. Some rudimentary furnishings were also provided by the Germans to American POWs, typically tables and chairs. And this is a pretty heavily furnished um, barracks right here. But these pieces all form the raw substance for a few pieces in the museum's collection. In the Pacific, where camps were often remote and small and access to material of any kind was limited, POWs turned to nature. And they were sometimes allowed by their guards to forage for food. So they would go out into the surrounding area and look for things that might be edible. In addition to being a source for nutrition, um, POWs used the land around, around them, the nature, they used it to craft items. They made compounds by tapping rubber trees and mixing them with sand. They made paper from grass and they used bamboo for almost everything imaginable. Some of the items in our collection and some of the items made by POWs use a variety of substances. So this is one piece on the left that is featured in Soldier Artist, and it is a crystal radio. This little piece was made in Stalag 17B. It's 50 miles northwest of Vienna. It was made by an American POW, A. Wesley Wright, who served as a top turret gunner in a B-17 with the 8th Air Force, 96th Bombardment Group. And he was shot down on November 29, 1943. But he had learned as a teen to build these crystal radios. So when he gets in the camp, he, um, you know, it's one of the first things that, that he wanted to do. And he traded American cigarettes with French POWs who were good at collecting things in general, um, he obtained the crystal for the radio. That's one of the things that he couldn't make himself. Um, he obtained that from via trade. So the radio, the outer case uh, is a soap dish, is a plastic Bakelite um, soap dish. And the other components include a, a foil ball that was made by 
um, by putting together lots of cigarette packages, a thimble, a sewing needle, a toothbrush handle, part of a belt, part of a broomstick, some salvage wire. So a lot went into making this particular tiny little piece. It's smaller than your cell phone, really. You know, it's a small, small item. And it had to be hidden also. It was, you know, a contraband item. The um, maker described how they also needed another component that we don't have in the collection, and that was a 75-foot-long antenna, um, so a piece of wire that had to be stretched around the barracks or around the, the camp to be able to pick up a signal, which um, they were able to hear the BBC um, broadcasting to Vienna from London. So... Uh, it did work. It was actually a piece that was actually used in the camp. Um, so they would listen to the BBC and then pass the news along to their fellow POWs. And that's something you do see in the, in the fantastic film, Stalag 17. Um, if you want to learn more about that film or hear about it, you can check out our podcast, Service on Celluloid, where we talked about, um, reviewed Stalag 17. So the radio in Stalag 17 plays an important role, and, and news about the war and being able to stay connected to the outside world and to have hope in your situation as a POW that you might someday be liberated, someday be reunited with your family. That was crucial. So here's another image from Soldier Artist. We talked already about the number one source of POW conversation and a constant obsession, occupation, and that's food. So in Soldier Artist, here in this photo, you see two examples of stoves made by POWs in Europe. Those are the pieces on the right in this exhibit case. The one in the front is a small stove. It's a burner, really. Um, made by an American POW, Lieutenant Howarth Taylor, while had held prisoner in OFLOG 13B. The stove was built, again, out of tin cans, out of cans, and was referred to as a Smoky Joe. Lieutenant Taylor was taken prisoner during the Battle of the Bulge shortly after he joined the 106th Infantry Division in the Ardennes. The other stove behind um, the small Smoky Joe is, so it's a larger affair, and it's actually a replica stove that was made later after the war by POW technician fourth grade Edward Laporta, and he served in the 6th Armored Infantry Regiment, 1st Infantry, 1st Armored Division, and he was captured at Kasserine Pass in North Africa. He used a stove like this while he was prisoner at Stalag 3B, and he built this replica stove many years later as an example to show when he discussed his experiences to, um, to groups, to audiences, to his family, to, to schools, etc. And the stove, you can see, includes a fan that forces more air into the coal provided to cook rations. So here you can see an illustration. This was a, a fairly common, um, commonly produced piece. You can see this is an illustration from a completely different camp on, from a journal on the right, GI cooking with a blower, and then uh, on the left, sorry. And then on the right, you can see other POWs cooking. That's at, um, at, in Mosberg, Stalag 7A, after liberation. So. And here is yet another illustration of that piece. This was done by George Vazel, who was a POW in Stalaglyph 3 and then in 7A. He was very familiar with these items, and he detailed them in an illustration which he entitled An Excerpt from the Encyclopedia of Stalag Science and Culture. He goes on to describe the Kriegi force blower. He describes it as a contraption by which prisoners of war under trying conditions are able to cook their meals. It consists of a handmade tin fan propelled by a hand wheel and geared to a high speed. The fan forces a draft to the bottom of the firebox, causing a forced burning. 
The fuel used is cardboard, straw, sawdust, or any kind of scraps of wood procurable from the barracks beds and floors or around the camp. Fence posts were used when there was an extreme shortage of wood. So that's just one piece of, of prisoner of war life in the Pacific and one item from the Encyclopedia of Stalag Science and Culture. Some other pieces that are featured here are an ice cream maker, an ice cream churn, you know, some other really interesting things. Um, but the Kriegi forest burner, the Kriegi blower was something that was seen throughout POW camps in Europe. Another item related to food, I'm going to go back a couple slides. You can see this piece. Uh, so on the left, you see the crystal radio. And then behind the radio, you see this a tray. And that tray is made from flattened cans. So it's made, you know, hammered out cans. And then they're fastened together with um, some joints. And they're made from something that was called a Klim can. So Klim was a brand of powdered can milk. And it was included in Red Cross rations for a lot of POWs. It had a long shelf life. It could be transported, was high in calories, all that good stuff. Prisoners manu remanufactured the tin cans into all kinds of things. In addition to items like this pan, Klim cans were used to create some of the ductwork for escape tunnels. They were used to create tools with which to dig tunnels and make all kinds of other things. So this tray was made by bomber pilot William Terrell, Terrell who was a POW in Stalagluft 1. And we also, I also talk about him in, in articles on our website. So if you want to learn more, you can look up the liberation of Stalagluft 1, learn about William Terrell. So Klim cans make an appearance also later on in this presentation. So keep that in mind. So the next piece we can examine is a pair of handmade wings. That's on the top right, the pair of wings on the top right is actually featured in um, Soldier Artist. Earning one's wings was a critical component of the air service, a symbol of accomplishment, of pride. And you see First Lieutenant Gilbert Blackwell. He was a fighter pilot in the 86 fighter bomber group, 527th Squadron. He served in Africa, Sicily, and Italy. And on February 2nd, 1944, his P-47 was shot down and he was taken prisoner. He was seriously injured. And then later, his right leg had to be amputated. His uniform became, you know, was unusable. It was tattered, torn to shreds. Um, and he was given a Canadian um, battle jacket that you see in Soldier Artist. And he also made a pair, carved a pair of wooden wings. And that's what you see top right. He's an interesting figure because he was actually repatriated as part of a prisoner exchange. And that did occur in rare instances, but mainly with... Um, with individuals who the Germans considered, um, who they considered would not return to flying or return to the fight. And those were individuals who had been blinded, who um, were amputees, etc. So Blackwell was back home in New Orleans in late 1944. In addition to his wooden wings, you see the additional wings on the bottom, and those were made in POW camps as well, but they were cast. So people, another way to make wings besides carving was to melt down the foil from the cigarette packs again, or to use material from the cans by pouring them into a mold. And in his little encyclopedia of Stalag science, George Vassell talked about how molds, these molds were made from dry clay and ashes. So those are all examples of handmade wings. 
Here you see an image from Soldier Artist on the right. One of the most surprising collections of POW made material came to us just prior to the opening of Guest of the Third Reich, so in 2012. And that's a hand carved B24 model and a violin carved by POW First Lieutenant Claire Klein, who was with um, the 448th Bombardment Group, 714th Bombardment Squadron, and he was in Stalaglift 1. In 1944, when he, you can see that's that's him with the violin and a little tiny um, pen knife that he used to carve the piece. So he also used, you know, improvised tools like broken glass, and he used glue scraped from the bottom of the German mess hall table. So any little bit of of material that you could use was called into play. It took. Klein four months to finish this work, this is his masterpiece. He would work on it outside of the barracks. Um, before Christmas 1944, he had enough time left to practice for a short Christmas concert for his barracks. And that was a very memorable experience for a lot of individuals in Stalaglift One. Klein said modestly about his piece, it was just something for my own amazement. But it amazed many, really. Some POW-made material, like the violin, was recognized as art at the time of its creation. Art shows, exhibitions, and craft days took place within several camps. This violin also traveled as part of an exhibit by the Air Force that took place shortly after the war. It was called the Army Air Force POW Exposition and it opened at the Museum of Science and Industry in New York in October 1945, so mere months after these, many of these men returned home. The show toured the country for a year, and it was seen by over 4 million people, and the violin became a highlight of this tour, and it was actually played during openings and during events. Some of this material that traveled as part of the show is now at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. But the Klein family, who donated this piece to the museum, the Klein family stated that the violin had been on display in their home and that Klein had made other instruments, but that this one really stood as a testament to what one could accomplish with little tools and steady hard work. In 2017, Filmmaker Adam Anderegg directed the film Instrument of War about Klein's experiences and his artwork. The film can be viewed online, and the plot is described as such. When U.S. B-24 bomber pilot Claire Klein is shot down and captured in northern Germany, one war ends and another begins, a war to keep hope alive. Now behind Nazi barbed wire and oppression, Klein and his fellow POWs must find a way to bond together to transcend their captivity, inspired by true events. So that, those true events, uh, you know, that's the making of the violin, essentially, in the film. So check that out online if you are inclined. Here you can see a close-up of both of those items. In Europe, these pieces of trench art were referred to as Kriegi inventions. Kriegi is short for Kriegsgefangener or POW. Some of these inventions were detailed in a journal by Erwin Stavroff, who was in Stalaglift I. He was a guest to our Guest of the Third Reich show in 2013, and when he saw the violin on display, he couldn't believe it. He remembered it from his days at Stalaglift I. It was a very emotional visit which he talks about in his oral history on the museum's digital collection site. When I was called down to the gallery the day of his visit, Mr. Stavroff was standing before the violin with tears in his eyes. It was very powerful to be able to talk to somebody who had intimate knowledge about this piece and, and, and about what it meant. And it started a relationship, and he subsequently donated this journal of his experiences at Stalaglift One that he mentioned, in which he mentions the very piece. He talks about ingenuity personified. The following things are made by the Kriegis, which I believe are terrific. One, Kriegi clock. And that Kriegi clock, I think, is actually a piece that traveled in the exposition as well um, and is at the Museum of the U.S. Air Force. But the second item um, is the violin, beautiful work and good tone. 
and wooden plane models he talks about. So it's wonderful to be able to connect that collection piece with this archival treasure. So they were Kriegi inventions, but they were also ways to transcend the tedium and uncertainty of the camp. Here you can see, you know, someone designing a project that's actually by George Vassell as well, designing a project to, you know, escape the camp. So all of these inventions that you would make up, some of them were never realized, you know, into trench art, but, but were just designed. In turning to the Pacific Theater, we do see some similarities. These are pieces that are displayed in the Road to Tokyo Gallery. They're from POW Colonel Jesse Trawick, who was on General Wainwright's staff. He was born in 1900, and he was a graduate of a 1924 West Point graduate who had been married for decades with two children by the time he goes into captivity. So he etched and decorated this canteen and another one, actually. You see, what you see here um, in the image on the right is his West Point ring, and then also, which he managed to save during his captivity, and then um, a canteen that he decorated almost every inch of with um, the battling bastards of Bataan across the canteen. So, um, you know, that's one common piece. You know, he didn't have much with him when he went into captivity, but the canteen was a lifesaver, and that's something that he kept with him and used. In addition to the material from American servicemen who were held as POWs, we also have material made by many American civilians, P civilian POWs in the Philippines. And again, bamboo was a common substance there as well. And, and those, are, those items will also be showcased in the Liberation Pavilion. And then I, now I want to talk about one of the museum's newest collections of POW material, a large collection of POW material from the Pacific, from Captain Robert Chandler, and he served as the commanding officer of Company C, 803rd Aviation Engineer Battalion based in the Philippines. They were tasked with building the facilities at Clark Field. On April 9, 1942, after months of fighting and deprivation, Chandler's years as a POW began with the surrender of American forces in the Philippines. So again, we're coming up on that anniversary. Like most of the POWs in the Pacific, Chandler spent more than three years being marched, moved, and transferred via hell ship to forced labor locations around Japanese-held territory. His education and pre-war training would aid him um, greatly during his imprisonment. After graduating from Auburn University in 1936, Chandler worked with the Engineer Corps and the St. Louis Engineering District on Mississippi River construction. He would see a different side of dock work and freight yards as a forced laborer shoveling and loading coal and trying to survive. So he was a skilled draftsman and resourceful engineer which, you know, his education and training made him really the ideal trench artist in a way. You know, he, he was, he had the skills to create a lot of different kinds of material. Throughout his time as a POW, he documented his imprisonment in words and lists and sketches of his environment and fellow POWs and guards. And he created, he crafted many tools to make his work and his life easier, if, if just a little bit. So he amassed and was able to keep a great, a large collection of POW material, which his family has generously donated to the museum. So what you see on the left are um, candlesticks. So they're candle holders. And they're not just um, useful, but there are also little decorative flares on there. You know, there's a little scrolled um, handle with which to carry the the candlestick. Then you can see on the right we have some of the tools that he used to make these pieces. So he had a small sewing kit. And then on the left you see carved chess pieces 
and a pipe and a tiny pencil. So when you think about, you know, no bit of material was wasted, you can see that pencil there, you know, it's barely a pencil any longer, but it's useful. And the fact that he saved that and that we have it in the collection is really important. Chandler's collection contains nearly every single um, category of POW trench art from recreation to certainly the util utilitarian pieces. On the right, again, you see the famous Klim can make an appearance. And that's an interesting piece. It's a thermos. So it has, it is multi-layered. It has an interior can and then an insulated outer um, container. So that's like six different pieces and lots of different um, components similar to the crystal radio. Here you see a pair of gloves. So he used scraps of leather and army fabric to make some pieces to wear. So there are a couple of pairs of mittens. Um, this is a pair of leather gloves. There's also a pair of denim gloves and you can see some of the coal stains on some of the pieces still from when he was um, forced to uh, haul and shovel coal. And there you can see his work as an artist as well. So that, that portrait was drawn after liberation when he was recuperating in an army hospital. So sometimes people ask why captors allowed this kind of, you know, frivolity or creativity in the camps. And in many instances, it was thought that if one was busy and engaged with this kind of activity with crafts or other entertainment or creation, then you weren't trying to escape and you, or otherwise sabotage the system, you know, get in your captor's hair or, you know, um, be a nuisance. So this, this was actually encouraged in some camps. So those were just some of the treasures from this particular area in our collection. The material is surprising, it's innovative, and it's important. I'd like to thank you all for watching, for your interest in learning more about the American POW experience. The Soldier Artist exhibit is on display through January 15th, and we're open for business and would love to have you visit. Also, stay tuned and keep watch on the museum's website for an announcement later this year for a second run of the continuing education course on the American POW experience to learn more about these POW artists and others. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Kim. We will now be taking questions from both Vimeo and Facebook from our audience members. So if you have any questions, please place them in the chat on Vimeo or as a comment on Facebook. So let's jump on in. So one of the questions we have is from Richard, which was how were the canteens carved? Um, they were typically, we can actually even go back and look at one. So they were usually, you know, they're sometimes with a small knife or another tool. It's, it's more of an etching maybe, you know, with single pin points. So I'm not a, an artist myself in that area, but um, I believe we did have a workshop that illustrated some of that kind of metal work where, you know, it was very rudimentary metal work. But POWs often had a lot of time to be very detailed. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to believe that some of these individuals had knives. You know, it seems like that's a weapon. Why would they have that in the camp? But they actually did um, in some instances. Even in Robert Chandler's sewing kit, you can see, you know, there are needles in there. There are, there's a pair of scissors. So, you know, they, they did have some material with which to make a mark, make their mark in the canteens, which are fairly pliable, fairly soft. Absolutely. So Nancy was asking about the knitting needles and yarn that were sent to POW camps. And so were they knitting hats, scarves, and things like that as well? 
They were. And, you know, one common practice was to use, reuse old material and old uniform pieces. So you could, you know, you would pull a thread on an old, you know, pair of socks and use it to make something else. But there was an initiative through the American Red Cross to send um, woolen items into camp. So, you know, they were sent ready-made, um, you know, made to wear. Uh, so pieces were also sent into the camps and family could do that as well. So the Red Cross distributed, put together um, patterns and material f with which, you know, people could knit um, scarves and vests and sweaters for servicemen. And the museum has a knit your bit program that we have been operating for 15. over a decade, 15 years. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's based on that, that idea, that initiative. Perfect. So thinking about the Red Cross boxes, Rose had asked a few different questions about the process uh -huh. of those boxes being assembled, who all could participate in it, and how did they get to the POWs? So that was largely a volunteer effort. The American Red Cross relied on many volunteers to assemble these aid packages. And I believe on the Guest of the Third Red Reich website, there's an image of some of those volunteers at work. Some factories donated assembly line time for the Red Cross to be able to pack those boxes. You saw in that photograph just how many um, crates and pallets and, you know, 27 million parcels. That's an enormous amount. And that was really a volunteer effort that required, you know, millions of Americans to uh, come together and work on that for the betterment of POW life. And those were, they were distributed through various channels. So the Red Cross actually um, purchased a ship, um, which, which they used for, you know, to provide POW aid, but they also used it for POW re repatriation. So the ship, the MS Grips Home, was used to um, bring POWs home. Actually, Blackwell, um, Gilbert Blackwell wrote, came back to the States on the MS Grips home, but it was also used to bring supplies to Europe. So the idea with the, um, with the Pacific Theater POWs is that aid would go through uh, the Soviet Union. And so that was another complication in, um, in aid factors there. Very interesting. So kind of building again on the Red Cross, Catherine has a question. Um, given that many camp guards were cruel, especially in the Pacific Theater, why did they let parcels through and why didn't they open the parcels and keep items for themselves? There's some evidence that they actually did, that they did keep items for themselves, um, especially in the Pacific where, you know, the distribution of scrolling back to these these parcels you know where the distribution was really random um you know it was used as a, a reward sometimes or withholding them was used as a punishment you know there was no regularity or predictability of when those packages would be received and even in europe where um you know aid was allowed in the knowing when they would come was, you know, it was chance. So the, as the situation in Europe, as the Allies um, gained ground and German communication and transportation lines broke down, so did the POW aid system. So, you know, things changed over time. But, but yeah, there was evidence that in some camps, even in German camps, guards stockpiled the packages and um, didn't allow them through regularly. There were also instances where, you know, you need winter clothes and you get a bathing suit or something like that. You know, those kinds of where the supply wasn't, wasn't really necessarily what you needed. Um, and, but yeah. 
and trust. The fact that they got through at all is is pretty amazing. And and many um, European theater POWs especially credit the Red Cross with that le- saving their lives. Definitely. So kind of switching gears a little bit, there are quite a few questions about um, POW treatment in both theaters regarding different groups of people. So the first one from David is, can you discuss the African-American POW treatment in both theaters? So in Europe, um, there were, you know, many, I I don't have numbers, but there were many um, African-American POWs. And we have some articles on our website on African-Americans who were held in German camps. Rothaker Smith is a a fantastic example. Um, He wrote about his experiences. And African-Americans in Europe thought that they were afraid that they would not even be taken prisoner at all, that they would just be killed, you know, that the Germans would see them as, um, as less than and would kill them. And so he was surprised even that he was taken prisoner. Now within the camps, you know, it it varied from camp to camp, certainly treatment of um, African Americans, of Jewish Americans, it varied within camp, you know, camp to camp, depending on various camp leaders. And um, so, It could range from, you know, but there was also, there were also stories of discrimination and mistreatment even among American soldiers, of African American soldiers. So we have um, on VE Day last year, we had a program with Stalag Luft 1 POW James Bainham, and he talked about how they had an African American, a Tuskegee Airman, come into the camp and the Americans drew straws to see who would get him in their barracks because no one wanted to take the African-American in their barracks. So, you know, there there are lots of stories um, along those lines. It's very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Well, you also touched on the Jewish-American experience there. Um, do you want to elaborate on that some more or? Sure. The, the you know, that was a, a very scary um thought for many Jewish Americans that they would be taken prisoner by the Germans. And again, they, they thought that if they were to be captured and recognized as being Jewish, that they would be killed. And, and that was a very real threat. And the Germans interrogators used that all the time. And, and we even have one story where, you know, where a German interrogator actually asked someone their religion, asked him to write it down on on a card, his intake card, essentially. And he started, he wrote a, a J, not knowing that they would, you know, or not knowing what they would do. And they, um, and his guard just slow, he said his guard just shook his head, didn't say a word, shook his head and turned it into a P. So there are some, for a Protestant, you know, so there are even some instances where individual guards where interrogators did intervene in a way but then there are other stories of of war war crimes where um, individuals were isolated were sent to um, you know infamously sent to the Berga um, concentration camp or sent to Buchenwald we have um, articles and programs that can be viewed on our website about both of those instances Yeah, it's uh, very difficult to hear the different experiences of these POWs. So I do want to thank you, Kim, for taking the time to talk about that and also to share about the innovation that came out of um, these POW camps during World War II. It's really amazing to see what they were able to create with what little they had. And I do want to thank ARP Louisiana again for sponsoring this program. And I do want to thank each and every one of you who tuned in today. If you want to learn more about upcoming programs, I encourage you to like our Facebook page and also check back onto our website. You'll be able to find this lecture along with others that have been done over the years from there. So take care, and we look forward to seeing you next time here at the National World War II Museum.